Hi there, um, Sunit from the Institute for Global Change. Um, this question is mainly for the last speaker. Um, it was really interesting to see all the sort of data analysis that you did and, um, and the fact that the, the sort of texting initiative didn't actually push government to deliver. Um, I sort of had a parallel experience of that in my previous role and I spent years perfecting what I thought was a really beautiful data collecting system and it was shared. And it became apparent, like with you, that the data was not the, either the data was not the binding constraint or it was one of several binding constraints. And it made me think a lot more about the complex ecosystem of what motivates people to do really well. And so for me, like I know if I did exercise every day and ate a really good diet and slept eight hours a night, I'd be great, but I don't do it. And so I wondered if you had any reflections on what are the motivating factors that would make government, um, particularly like lower level public servants, do their jobs um, if, if the data or, or public shaming is not sufficient? Um, well, this is a huge question. <laughs> um, I think, first of all, I want to separate between two types of actors that we had in government. One is the district officials and one is the, the service uh, providers, okay? And so, um, uh, the hope was that, uh, that the pressure on um, service providers, and when I say service providers, these are the, the, the frontline service providers, the teachers and the nurses in the, in the clinics and the, the school, that the pressure will come not necessarily from citizens, but will come from uh, from uh, government and um, and so um, and this comes from uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's been a, a lot of studies recently where government has been cut off completely and the, like the idea was to organize communities to monitor uh, directly service providers and, and this usually fails okay because of like as I said like disparities and in power and, and, and collective action problems and so the idea was to bring the government back in. Um, I think the, in, in order to, f to, to get the, 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 the district government to be more active, um, we, we, I, I, think, I think more could be done. Uh, one thing that we haven't, one thing that we failed to do is create common knowledge. And I think this is something that is very important. When, by common knowledge is the way the platform ultimately worked because of the limitations of not being in a G4 world, in, but in a G2 world, is that it was person to government. I send the message and only I know what I sent and, and uh, only uh, and the government kind of is communicating with me. Um, if you look at the like platforms like 311, Philly and like others in, 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 in more developed countries, um, you see that information is aggregated in a very conspicuous way on the website of where other people can see what came in, what has been addressed, uh, how much has been addressed and I think that like uh, creating a common knowledge where not only I, but other people also know what are messages that came in, what has been addressed or not, is really important to get government to feel some pressure uh, to, uh, to um, act upon the information that they get. Um, I think I was going to ask a very similar question, so maybe it's a, more of a comment. But the, I mean, the GAP program, it's something which the, I, w I work for the European Commission, I think it's the, e the EU either has or or is going to be supporting the GAP program. But I had a question about this, this difference and transition between transparency and, and accountability. Uh, um, and the fact that, as you were saying, with, the, with this one-to-one -one connection, rather than aggregating it and publicizing those results so that, for example, the, the, the different layers of local government within, within that region Arua, um, were not named and shamed, but there was a, an indication of how they were operating and to what level of efficiency. And equally for the, for the actual uh, facilities, the, the, the clinics, the, the schools and so on, that they could see how well, how many reports there were about that particular facility and what had happened about them. Um, and, I, and I know that uh, two things about Uganda, uh, which are maybe relevant, is that one, they, don't, they haven't had local council elections for like 20 years, so there's very little accountability there. Um, and that secondly, nepotism and corruption in those kind of uh, facilities and, 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 and uh, 
services are, is very, very high. So without that kind of accountability, you're not going to get much response, no matter what kind of transparency. But I think it's a, it's a, very, it's a fascinating initiative, and I, I think it's something we, we, we definitely would follow up on. I just want to say one thing about that very quickly, that uh, just to correct, like at the district level, so there's uh, district councillors. Uh, uh, each district is divided to sub counties, and each sub county sends a, a male and a female representative. Um, for these types of uh, councillors, uh, there's been a periodic elections every five years. There was in 2016, 2011, and so. Uh, the place where we didn't have elections in, in Uganda is only at the village level, the LC1 for, for 20 years, but, but at the level of the, kind of the district and the sub-county, uh, the elections were regular every five years. Yeah, hi, Kirsten from UN Global Pulse. I just wanted to, to make a comment that we, we should maybe look also beyond the internet and say, well, we can do summaries through radio, for example so that people know, okay, this has been reported and this has been worked on, yes or no, so that people get a feedback like that. Um, and secondly, I think there were a lot of talks over the last two days already about we provide information to, to the governments and nothing is being done. So maybe we should engage also more with the power relations around governance and not just say, okay, information is the problem. Information is part of the problem, but then we should also think on how we can strengthen the compact between citizens and the government and on taxes, etc. around that. Cool. One more question for the room and then we'll answer several at once. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Hi, uh, Michael Meyer Sender from Democracy Reporting International. A question to Tiago on your research. Um, it's very interesting research because generally I think at the moment the assumption is traditional media play a better role on the social media than anybody else and uh, them being undercut is a problem for democracy because there's no gatekeeping and no fact checking etc. Uh, you didn't say very much how you measured uh, media journalism so what kind of sources did you look to compare to um, what political parties and candidates said that would be one question and another is maybe to moderate the findings a bit or maybe you could comment on that you know you could say all oh, the journalists they raise scandal instead of talking about programs but in terms of accountability of course scandal sometimes is a good thing there may be a scandal with a politician, it's about his or her honesty. So it's something we want journalists to do. So that's not programmatic reporting, but still very important for accountability. So if you could talk about this, and maybe a small question to a colleague from Sierra Leone. You uh, concluded by saying complex problems are not that geared towards being solved by technology. If you could just add two, three sentences on that takeaway, I would like to understand that takeaway better. Yeah, thanks. So, uh, basically, I'm sorry. Um, it's like uh, I presented it like kind of the bright side and good news, but of course, this I was looking only in institutional communication. So I don't, I didn't look how people interact and communicate with each other in these platforms and how polarized it is, how, how informative it is. So, but the alternative would be much, much worse. It would mean that parties don't care at all, and that would mean that no matter which channel elections will never be so informative to the to the citizens so in that sense uh, it's still uh, good uh, to see this and to find out that still parties do care and they do try to inform the electorate and uh, how i compared it was i looked at the pre press so it's a more conservative approach if i look at television the, the difference would be much higher because as you know, the press is still more informative and still the salience of conflict and horse race strategy is much lower there, even though some studies show that it's becoming similar to, the, to television, so the differences are no longer so drastic. But still, it's a conservative approach, so in the, in the sense that it gives more value to these differences. And uh, of course, the, the, the scandal, like you have this watchdog role of journalists and they are perceived that informing the people and this is important to know that and my point was not really that. I, it's just, 
it was a small note. I'll see how the difference, how media can somehow distort a campaign by overemphasizing scandal. Of course, it's important to note this, but in every single newspaper, I have three or four articles about scandals of politicians might have a somehow kind of a negative impact on the, the attitudes of these citizens towards politics because basically what they read is only about scandal and uh, how bad their politicians are. And uh, in that sense, if they follow the campaigns on social media, then it's not as bad. Of course, I'm looking at institutional communication again, and I don't know what their friends are talking about, what is like people discussing. Probably if you look at user, user data, of course, the scandal <laughs> type of story will be much more salient. But still, uh, it's good to see, that, I, I, in my opinion, that politicians are not as negative and are not so interested in discussing attacking their opponents based on this kind of uh, story. So, I guess. Thank you. Sorry, so I, um, to reframe your question is a few more words around uh, the last comment I made as to do not include technology when the problem is still too complex. <clears throat> so I think the, the basic premise is that uh, technology tends to undermine our problem-solving skills. Um, so, and the assumption is that when you first encounter the problem, it is complex, and you need to first begin to understand it. The place to start from is not to introduce technology. It's not for you to throw a solution at a problem that you have just encountered, right? Um, so you first need to start understanding that problem before you can then figure out where exactly and how specifically can technology help you. Um, the other, the flip side to it was also that when you have um, complex solutions, it may also not be a good point in time to bring in technology. And by that I mean that um, I think in the, in the process of problem solving, we get to points in time where we have multiple um, ways in which technology can help us. And you need to you know, slow down a bit and you know, streamline on that. That's kind of what I meant by when the solution is too complex. Right, thank you. Cool, perfect timing. Thanks to all our speakers. There's now a uh, short break before the next event. Thank you.